Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com. And you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry. And we do small groups all over our community, from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. If you know, last week we started a new series called Hello, My Name is God. My name is Edward Austin Crouch. I hail from Longview, Texas. I now live in Hawkins, America. Amen. And uh, my name means prosperous guardian. Prosperous guardian. What's your name mean? You ever ask that? You ever tried to figure out what your name meant? Uh, when I was in high school, I, don't, I was thinking about this this morning. Uh, when, when I was a senior in high school, we did a thing called senior books. And I don't know if seniors do that now anymore, but this was way back in the 80s and Stone Age for some of you, and I'm fixing to date myself um, on this. But there was this one page on there, most likely two. Did you, anybody else have those pages? Where, and you would go around and ask people to fill out your senior book. And, and on my page, I don't remember anything else in this book, honestly. It's been too many years. I don't even know where it is don't even want to see it, honestly. Uh, but I do remember this one statement, most likely to, Edward Crouch, most likely to take over PTL. Now, how many of you know what PTL is? Remember Jim Baker, Tammy Faye, the tears, all that, the, the top part? Yeah, I know. And, and some of you, let me bring it up to date. TBN? Okay, so if you don't even know what that is, just Christian television in general. They said I was most likely to take over Christian television. Now, honestly, that's not happened, amen? And I'm kind of glad in some ways we are on Facebook Live. Thank you for joining us. And uh, we're on Etex every week. So that's about the extent of our television ministry. Uh, but I just, I think back of all the different things about what your name means, because names mean something. And I, I know that my name meant something in high school. It means something totally different now in maturity because names are important. They, they matter. And God's name is his reputation. And many times you bring up your name and certain circles, your name may mean something different than it means in other circles. And, and so, because we all have that, because we equate the name with the reputation. In fact, Danielle and I were sitting on the back porch this last week and, and we were talking about somebody and, and we would say, man, they are really making a name for themselves, whether it be a kid at school that's getting in trouble all the time or somebody that just seems like everything they touch turns to gold. And we just, we know that because names matter. Your name is the summary of everything that you are. It's your character, your reputation, your brand. Branding is important. In fact, if I said apple, how many of you guys think of something you eat? How many of you think of a phone? Yeah, it's branding, isn't it? How about Ford? Some of you just, when I said that, you got chill bumps all over you because you love Fords. Others of you kind of threw up a little bit in your mouth, amen? <laughs> right? Because it's branding, right? How about Bill Gates? Steve Jobs? Trump. I'm, I'm sorry. I had to go there. It's all about branding. Okay. So don't shoot me. Don't throw anything at me. Um, see, all these names, all these companies mean something. We understand branding. A brand, your identity, your reputation, your name matters. And God's names matter. And God has given us names all through his scripture and all through so that we would understand. And they're not just merely words. And so many times in scripture, we will read over the name God and never find out what that name means, what the meaning behind it. Because in our English language, we're so simple and yet we don't follow any rules. But when you go back to the Hebrew and the Greek, there are so many rules that you follow that mean something, that words have meaning to them, their character qualities, their promises. Um, they're, 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 and we'll miss them if we don't kind of drill down in them. And so what we're going to do over the next few weeks, we're going to look at the seven redemptive names. But before we can get to the redemptive names, we need to look at the three foundational names. And today we want to start with the first foundational name of God. It's found in Genesis chapter 1. At the very beginning of Scripture, we find the name Elohim. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, let's look at it. In the beginning, what's that word? In the beginning, what? Elohim. 
right there, right off the bat. We're, we're four words into what we call the Bible, and we have the first name of God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And literally, that word God, Elohim, in the Hebrew literally means strong one, strong one, the creator God. Simply opening up, God says, hello, I want you to know who I am. Hello, my name is the strong creator God. You may be sitting there going, okay. <laughs> What's that mean, right? Because so many times we'll just read on past that and we'll look at that. Let me mention two reasons why I believe God kind of introduced him. I want to put them on the screen. Number one, I think he wants us to understand that he's transcendent. In other words, he is, he, he, rather than being a part of his creation, he's outside of his creation. He is mystical. He is uh, uh, set apart, number two. And he is set apart from time, from space and even matter. When we read in the beginning, God created, we discern that God created the beginning. He is set apart from time. Now think about this, and I'm gonna hurt your brain a little bit this morning, and I, I don't want you to think too much about this because some of you are way smarter than I am. And I, so I, but I know for me, the more I think about this, and I was sitting on my back porch on Thursday morning, and, and I was writing this and studying and pulling all my notes from the last few weeks, and I was just like, man, this hurts my brain. So, so think about this. If God created time, right? Then he preceded time because he couldn't have created something that already existed, right? So God created time. So therefore, he was before time. Because when you and I think about time, we're always thinking about yesterday, tomorrow, and today. When Scripture talks about God, Scripture always talks about God in the present tense, you and I have a yesterday. Some of you didn't have a good day yesterday. Others of you had a phenomenal day. How many of you took a nap yesterday? Anybody? Take a nap? Amen. God bless you. Amen. I didn't, okay? How many of you are going to take a nap tomorrow? Anybody got plans for a nap tomorrow? And how about today? You got a nap for today? Yeah. See, we have a yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Guess what? God has neither a yesterday or tomorrow. For everything for God is right now. I know. If you think about this right now stuff, that's kind of, it hurts your brain. But think about this. That means he is the right now, ever present God. He's never late. He's never early. He's right now. Think about that. Now, don't worry yourself out too much because some of you are right now going, okay, I, he doesn't have time. He created time. He just, I, I. Listen, here's the big thing, and this is huge. The bottom line is that the strong creator God is transcendent of time. But not only is he transcendent of time, he's also transcendent of space. God predates his creation. Now think about this. He comes before all things he's made, both the heavens and the earth. And it's kind of hard to comprehend, but follow me here. Before God created mankind, before he created the heavens and the earth and the universe, he created the space that it would exist. You think we serve a small God. Let that just camp for a minute in your head, right? He created the space that he then put us in. And while we comprehend this experience of the heavens and the earth because we exist in space, God existed before space existed. I know, some of you are like, what? I kind of mess your mind up here. And that kind of brings us to the third part because it kind of fits together. He transcends matter, which is precisely why some of you can't figure him out. Amen? That's why some of you, when you try to figure out God, we're not in his realm. We're not in his dimension. And we can't even begin to conceive what God believes or what God thinks or what God is unless he reveals himself to us. And that's what he's doing in Scripture. Because, see, when we look at God, we can't even begin to conceive all that that dimension holds of who God is. Because we're looking at him from our perspective in a 24-hour perspective, 365 days a year. We're looking at him from day and night. And God, he's above that, yet he's a part of it. Therefore, we can't comprehend it unless he reveals it to us. And what I love about this name is it reveals that, 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 that our God is one who abides in the realm we know. Not only is he outside of that, he also exists inside our realm. In fact, look at Jeremiah 23, 23, and 24. God asked two questions. Am I a God who is near, declares the Lord? Am I not a God far off? Can a man hide himself in hiding places so I don't see him? declares the Lord. Do I not feel the heavens and the earth, declares the Lord? See, here we see that God is both transcendent and imminent. That God is both out there and he's also right here. 
that he is there and everywhere. He created the heavens and the earth outside of existing in it. And yet he fills the heavens and earth by existing in them. So he's an everywhere, omnipresent God. And we're getting this in the first four words of the, New Te- of the Old Testament. That God steps into us and just says, I'm everywhere present at the same time. And you need to know that about me right off. I am the strong creator God. Wherever you are, wherever you go, I am everywhere. And yet I am out of here too. It's kind of mind-boggling, isn't it? When you think about that. In the scripture God identifies himself as Elohim 35 times at the beginning of Scripture. In fact, from Genesis 1-1 to Genesis 2-3, the first 34 verses of the Bible, literally he's only identifying himself as Elohim, the strong one. In the very beginning, God created, reflecting his authority, his greatness, his power. See, here's what we know. God creates, man does not create. Mankind only recalibrates, reconfigures, reforms, but we don't have the ability to create something from nothing. I know some of you are way smarter than me, but see, here's what I know. In Hebrews 11.3, here's what the writer of Hebrews says. Look at it. By faith, we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, by simply his word, so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. In other words, God created visible things out of invisible things, and man can't do that. We only can take what God gives us and what we have. See, inventors who create, they don't create something from nothing. They take what's here and they create. And we have some phenomenal creations that, God, that mankind has made. But they could not make anything unless God gave them something to work with. Amen? The author of Hebrews says those visible things out of invisible things. This is so cool. Because God didn't even use his hands to create. He just spoke it. I mean, go back and read Genesis 1 and look through all God was able to do the word, by his word. The earth, the stars, the sun, mankind, space. He spoke and brought them into, into existence. Aren't you glad he didn't shout? I mean, if he had shouted, can you imagine what he would have done? Maybe he shouted at that far off galaxy, right? I don't know. It says by his word he spoke. In Genesis 18, 14, we see where God responds to Abraham and Sarah when they're doubting God. And God looks at them and just simply says in Genesis 18, 14, is there anything too difficult for God? Is there anything too difficult for God? Even when he came to the Virgin Mary and said, listen, you're going you're gonna to conceive a baby and you're a virgin. She's like, oh, God, that's a problem. That's a, and he looks at her and the angel of the Lord says, nothing will be impossible with God. Which gives us incredible hope when we look at the Elohim, the strong creator God, that whatever situation that you find yourself in this morning, as Clay was praying over you for healing, as we were singing that song while ago, no matter where you find yourself, that the strong creator God is able and can at his word, at his word, overcome every obstacle that we face by his word. See, we get caught up in trying to Solve it, trying to figure it out. Because life happens, doesn't it? Life happens. We know that. We were talking about it last week and, and last Sunday that life happens. And so when we realize that God has given us his name so we can understand and tap into the power, the first thing he wants us to do is to look, I'm the strong creator, God. And no matter what you're facing, I'm there. I'm there. I'm out there, but I'm right with you too. It's an amazing thing because he's so personal. Look at Genesis 1, 3 through 5. I love this. In the very beginning, we get through chapter verses 1 and 2, and then verses 3 through 5. It says, then God, Elohim, said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning one day. God said... God saw, God separated, God called. Each of those words reveal a very personal and engaging character of God. Not only is he a strong God, but he's a very personal God. He's not out there floating around somewhere. Yes, he is other dimensional, don't forget that, but yet we see that he's intensely personal and he's involved with his creation. In fact, you look at chapter 2 in Genesis chapter 2, 15. It says, then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. Again, very personal. He took us and he placed us. 
Look at, look at chapter 2, verse 18. It says, then the Lord God said, it's not good for man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. And the scripture goes on that he brought all of creation in front of Adam and Adam named all of the creation and, and there was not one there suitable for Adam. So God could have said, well, tough, get over it. Instead, he got very personal with his creation and said, it's not good. So he caused man to fall into his sleep and he took a rib and he created woman. God is a personal God. And then you get to chapter three, it's intensely personal in Genesis 3, 8 through 9. They, talking about Adam and Eve, this is after they sinned, heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among all the trees in the garden. Then God called to the man and said to him, where are you? You see, God's more than a force. He's more than an energy. He's more than just hovering out there, a concept or a theory. We learn in just the first three chapters of Scripture that God is a personal, strong creator God. That in the cool of the evening, he walked with them. He didn't have to do that. See, we don't reside in a universe with no one to relate to. Because God is out there, but he's also right here. And we can relate to that. One more thing is when this personal characteristic of a God, Elohim, we see in the first, first few verses in the opening revelation of God himself that God is not only personal, he's also plural. There's the plurality of God. And the word Elohim is actually the plural version of the word El or Eloho. It's this, it's this interesting aspect of the plural word that, that uniquely refers to a singular Godhead, but there's something in that. Look at Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Then God said, let us, everybody say us. Let us make man in our own image according to our likeness. And God created man in his image and the image of God, he created him. God, scripture here uses both the plural and the singular pronouns when it's referring to Elohim. Now, now track with me. He works, his works are described with singular verbs, but, but Elohim is a plural word by construct, and it's often singular by usage, revealing the makeup of the Trinity. People ask me all the time, where, where do you get this Trinity from? Well, here we see this very first opening statement in Scripture that God, he didn't give us all. He doesn't flesh it all out. It's what theologians call progressive revelation so that as he begins to work through, he introduces himself, singular is God, but also that there is us in that, that there is a plural in that. And we know that Elohim refers to more than one. As the biblical revelation progresses, what we find is when we come to Matthew 28, 19, where God kind of fleshes this out. And he started back in Genesis. He says, go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of what? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So all the way back from the very first, God begins to introduce who he is until we find that place in Matthew chapter 28. And we finally see the three distinct persons, one in essence, which make up the plural name Elohim. Not only is he personal, I love this, and I had to struggle with this next thing, because I read this about four weeks ago, that not only is he personal, what we find in this name between verses one and two, that God is a restorer. And when I first discovered that, I thought, how can God be a restorer, one who restores between chapter one, verse one, and one, verse two, right? It's interesting, look at it. Genesis 1, 1 and 2, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Now, this is very interesting, because the Hebrew phrase, formless and void, basically means a waste, a garbage dump. Now, it's referring to a location that's completely uninhabitable. It's messed up, without form. So here's, what the, here's the questioning that comes along. So God created a wasteland, right? God created garbage. I don't think so. So what happened? You see, jump over to Isaiah 45. You don't have to jump, but look at the screen. It says this, for thus says the Lord, who created the heavens? He is the God who formed the earth and made it. He established it and did not create it a waste place, but formed it to be inhabited. 
I am the Lord and there is none else. So what happened between verses 1 and 2 in Genesis? Because Isaiah says God didn't create a waste dump, right? God didn't create something that was a garbage dump, right? So what happened? Many theologians, I can't prove this, but many theologians believe that Satan happened. The enemy happened. Because if you go back to Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14, 12 through 7 tells us that when the enemy rebelled against God, where did God cast the enemy down to? Anybody know? The earth. The earth. Now think about this. We see that the name Elohim, the strong creator God, and his plurality hovering over a wasteland of his creation. He's hovering over, and he, if, if, if it's true that God cast the enemy down the earth, and the enemy destroyed all that God had created, then what did God do in verse 2? He restored and brought order to that which was destroyed. You, you tracking with me? You tracking with me? See, in the creation account, we see he created light. He separated the swamp land and separated the land from the water. He made the earth livable. He came into something that Satan and his demons had messed up. And guess what? Restored it. He restored it. Again, we, we're thinking in 24 hour, 365 days, right? And so it's hard for us to even comprehend that between verse 1 and verse 2 that all that could take place. And remember, God's other dimensional, but he's also a right now God. Listen up, this is big for some of you, is that God can make what the enemy has destroyed and jumped up in your life, and he can restore that with his word. Because he's the Elohim. Not only is he personal, he restores that which the enemy jacks up. He restores that which the enemy tries to destroy. See, I love this. He's not only a God who's personal, strong creator God, but he's also one who restores. And when the enemy tries to make a mess of your life, his spirit can come and make it beautiful again, can bring peace. Even in, when, when you can't see it, God can bring peace because he's the strong one, because he's out there, but he's also right here. You see, when Satan tries and brings death where there once was life, God's spirit can make you live, live again. He can bring that which was destroyed back to life. And that alone should be enough to bring hope to some this morning. And you may be on that journey of darkness. You may be on that journey. Some of you have walked through that journey recently. And by his word, God has restored you. Some by doctors and some just by a flat out miracle. Amen? Because he's a strong Elohim. that can bring darkness to light. Desolate, uninhabited recesses of your soul can be brought back to fertile ground. That God can do that. So what do we do with this? What do we do with this this morning? See, last week we said that we can't live up to the name above every name, so we live out of that. So what do we do with Elohim? Go back to Genesis 2, chapter, verses 1 through 3, and look what it says. It says, Thus the heavens and the earth were completed, and all their host. By the seventh day, God completed his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all of his work which he had done. Then verse 3, then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he rested from all of his work which God had created and had made. So day one, God created. Day two, God created, right? Days three, four, five, and six, God created. And after he created on all these days, he said, that's good. And then when he created man, he said, oh, that's very good. And then on the seventh day, God rested. It's interesting that he rested because he sure didn't seem to work very hard. All he did was speak, amen? <laughs> you can laugh at that. Some of you are like, you can't say that. Yeah. He just spoke and creation came. He probably didn't get his hands dirty, but then he rested. He wasn't tired. I don't think he just quit. I think he just completed what he set out to do. Isn't that interesting? God just completed what he set out to do. In other words, God doesn't leave something undone. He completes what he set out to do. And then on the seventh day, he sanctified that day as rest. He didn't sanctify any other day of the week. He sanctified that day. In fact, not only did he sanctify that day, he carries this concept out through the Old and New Testaments relating it to other things. Not only did he sanctify the seventh day, he also consecrated and set apart the seventh year. So every seven years, they would let their fields rest. 
And then every 49th year, he had a year of restoration, the year of Jubilee. In the New Testament, we're never instructed to keep Saturday as a Sabbath day of rest. In fact, Paul, even Colossians 2, 16 through 17, he says that don't let anybody dictate your days. But listen, we typically set aside one day a week as a day of rest, and we do it on Sunday, the day of resurrection. And we set that a day. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 4, look at it. It says, for he has said everywhere, somewhere, concerning the seventh day, and God rested on the seventh day from all of his works. And then in verse 9, it gets very personal. So there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. In other words, we still have a Sabbath rest. This isn't a back then. This isn't something then. He says, for the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works, as God did from his. Therefore, let us be diligent to enter that rest rest. Now listen, when God finished everything, he created all the worlds and all that they contain, he rested because he was done. He was complete. The very nature of a strong creator is that God created and infused into everything he created with this ability to reproduce. Think about it. Flowers have seeds. Animals have the desire to reproduce. Insects are assigned to, to, to assist cross-pollination. And, and we, men and women, have been getting instilled in us the miracle of birth. So God only created once. And when he created, he created his, his creation to keep on creating. And he built into his capacity for reproduction for, for years to come that he is a strong God. And then he rested. Simply what God's telling us in Hebrews chapter 4 He's established a rest for us as well. Think about this. The Hebrew children, he created a rest for his people. It was called the promised land. This is so good. Because think about the promised land while they were in bondage. He was giving them a land that there was a people already cultivating the land, drilling wells, building cities. And then God called them out of bondage and said, all you got to do is go in and take it. The promised land. And think about us. They were in bondage. They were brought out. And then God has called us out of bondage called sin and death. And he's called us into a place of rest in Jesus Christ. And one of these days, he's going to invite us into eternity through the Lord Jesus Christ, through a relationship with him so that you and I may continue in that rest. See, rest doesn't always mean not moving. Some of you have that idea. Some of you have this idea, rest is that there's a 16-hour day to sleep, amen? That you're going to get 16 hours out of 24, right? And all you can do is just sleep. Now, that's about called vacation, right? Some of you don't even know what that means, all right? Um, because some of you have, you're busier on vacation than you are back home, and God bless you, I don't want a vacation with you, okay? Because um, I believe in 16-hour sleep days on vacation, all right? So um, but I believe God has a rest for us, that as a family member, that God has invited us in to rest and the creator, strong God. That he's already prepared works for us. So much striving that we do and scheming that we do, trying to be something for God. When in Ephesians 2 verse 10, look what Paul says, for we are his workmanship. God spoke, he breathed life into us. And he created in Christ Jesus for good works. In other words, he created us for good works which he's already prepared beforehand. In other words, the strong creator, God knew, Jim, that you would be here in Holly Lake Ranch, and while you didn't know you were going to be giving away 6,500 tons or 1,000 pounds or whatever it is, a bunch of food, you didn't know that God already knew that. Even back when you were doing funeral home stuff, man, he was burying people, and now he's feeding them, amen? That's good stuff right there. Listen, whatever God's going to do for you, he's already done. Let me say that again. Whatever God's going to do for you, he's already done. <laughs> I mean, whatever he has planned for you, he's already planned. He knew you'd be 20-something years in the military, probably going to be 30 if they're not done with you, amen? They're going to keep re-upping you. He's already planned it. He's already purposed for your life. Our job as a follower of Christ is not to try to outwit or outsmart or outplay God. We're just, we're, we're just, we're just going to walk with him as the strong creator God because he's already got the map. He's already, and it's a good one, by the way. That map's, a, I love maps. I was on Google Earth this morning looking around. I love maps, but God has a map for our life. He's already got it. And our obedience is all that is required 
to the strong creator God, Elohim. And see, we can be like the children of Israel. You remember, God said, I'm going to call you out of bondage. I've got this promised land I'm going to lead you to. But somewhere between bondage and the promised land, the children of Israel decided not to be obedient. And so God said, I'm just going to let you wander. You want to do it your way? That's okay. I still love you. And this is so cool because even in their disobedience, God gave them manna. Even in their disobedience, God took care of them. Even in their disobedience, they probably got to a point out there going, man, it's not too bad. You know, I kind of like that rock over there. That's the third time we've seen it in the last month. But, you know, I kind of like that thing. It's just like us. We get comfortable, don't we, in our disobedience. When all along God's just saying, I'm the strong creator God, and you don't understand, I've already got something out here planned for you. If you'll just be obedient. If you'll just be obedient. See, I think some of you are missing out on God's strong, creative, restored plan for your life. Because you just, you're, you're, well, look at Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. And don't lean on your what? Own understanding. In other words, don't be disobedient. But in all your ways acknowledge, in all your ways obey him, in all your ways come under him, in all your ways rest in his name, in all your ways live out of his name. And look at this, and he will make your paths straight. That power, that strength, that when we focus on him, I love Psalms 127, verse 2. I pray it at night sometimes. And when it says, it is, it is vain for you to rise up early, to retire late, to eat the bread of your painful labors. But I love this last line. For he gives to his beloved even in his sleep. Now listen to me. Elohim, the strong God, while you snore tonight, he's working. When you put your CPAP on, Darth Vader, and your wife's grateful you wear it, and your husband's grateful you wear it. Amen? Amen. Even while you sleep, the strong creator God works. See, some of you can't sleep because you've forgotten that he is the strong creator God, and that's why you lay awake at night trying to scheme your way figure it out. I don't know how many times I've prayed this prayer laying in bed where I'll just lay there going, God, there's a knot in my stomach right now and I don't know what to do with it. But God, you said you give rest to those who love you. You are the Elohim. So God, would you give me rest? And I'm telling you over and over and over again, I sleep. There was a day I didn't, church. You know that. There was a day it was all about Edward working hard and trying to prove and out scheme and outdo <laughs> that we can sleep well tonight knowing that Elohim is with you, that he can actually handle your life while you sleep, that he can make connections and intersections you need and give you wisdom to make choices. If that each day you will live out of his name and rest in the strong creator God. See, here's what I want for you. I don't want you just to read scripture and just write over that. Well, yeah, in the beginning, God. No, in the beginning, he is a strong creator, God. That is at work. And you may not see it right now because he's other dimensional, amen? But he's also right here. He's the right now God. And no matter what you're facing, you can call on him. And by his word, he can restore. By his word, he can put you on that path. By his word, because why? He's the Elohim. He's the strong creator God. He's got this. We don't have to mess around and figure it out. That's a pretty good resting place, isn't it? Just to rest in the Elohim. Let's pray together. Well, Lord, I love you. Thank you for your word. Thank you that your word is um, deep. It'll hurt our brain. It makes us think. And God, every once in a while, we just have to kind of dig around in there and find these truths. God, thank you that you are the Elohim, the strong creator. God, you made a name for yourself in the first 43 verses of what we call the Bible. And if that's all we knew, God, that you were just a strong creator, God, that's personal, 
that restores. And God, that would be enough. But you're so much more than that. It just, it just almost makes my mind hurt. God, thank you that you are a transcendent God, that you're both out there and right here. And that means that whatever we're facing today, God, that you have this. May we be obedient. May those of us who call ourselves believers, we'd be obedient to trust you, to live out of that, and to make as much of your name known as we're able and capable. Because names mean something. So God, give us courage to live out of that. That we would rest in the promised land of Jesus until one of these days you return. God, I look forward to that day. In fact, Lord, you told us to remember what you've done. Each time we take the cup and take the bread, as often as we eat or drink, that we're to remember that sacrifice that you made for us, that we may enter into your rest. Not just one day a week, every day. And then on a day like today, Sunday, on Resurrection Day, that we can enter in together and just rest in that you're the strong creator God. So Lord, I love you. Thank you. If there's somebody here this morning that does not know you, they've never given their life to you, Father, would you give them courage today to confess their sin and invite you to be the Lord of their life? Lord, I love you. Thank you for Jesus. As we respond, I pray you would be pleased with our worship. Move in this place, Lord. I love you. And we ask it in his beautiful name, Jesus. Amen. Hey, guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to... Uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ. Or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you. I promise you. Hey, have a great day. And listen, if you're looking for a great church and you you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you. Have a great week.